Hello, I'm Leonard Malton. When you've made a film that is not only extraordinarily successful, but has embedded itself in our popular culture, well, that's a tough act to follow. But George Lucas managed to pull it off. After Star Wars came, The Empire Strikes Back. A totally successful film in its own right, as well as one of the most popular sequels ever made. And he's here today to tell us a little about the genesis of that film and its place in the Star Wars trilogy. Thanks for being here, George. Thank you. Star Wars has come out. A success, I think it's fair to say, beyond your expectations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> At what point did you receive a commitment or an urging to do a sequel? And, and, and did you immediately say yes, or, or was there any hesitation on your part to do it? Well, it didn't really happen that way, because what I did when I was writing it, I wrote one movie, and then I couldn't do the whole movie because it was way too big. The first draft was, you know, it had too much stuff in it. It was way too big. It couldn't possibly be done. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, I'm going to have to take all these great ideas. I'm gonna, and that part I'm just going to have to cut out. And I'll just do the, what it was then really the first act. And I'll expand this and make this into a movie. So I did that. But then as a writer, you know, you create this whole thing and it's, you know, sitting there on the shelf. Um, so as soon as the film was successful, there wasn't any question in my mind that I would immediately go on and do the rest of them so I could finish it. What to you is the biggest difference, overall difference, between film number one and film number two? Well, um, the biggest problem I was grappling with in film number two is the fact that it's the middle act of a three-act play. Now, some people find it a darker film than the first. Well, it is a darker film because in the first act you introduce everybody, the second act, you put them in the worst possible position they can ever get into in their lives, and it's every, you know, and they're in a black hole, never able to get out. And in the third act, they get out. That's just, again, that's drama. That's the way it works. You don't have an exuberant, happy second act. What was the biggest technological advance between the making of one and the making of two? Well, there wasn't really too much of a technological... We, we refined what we had primarily, but there wasn't any giant... Techn the major technological break was in one, and that was using... Um, you know, uh, motion control cameras and that sort of thing to allow the ships to be able to move freely and that sort of thing. That was the big advance. Everything after that was um, we were able to do more stop motion. I was able to do a lot more things. They weren't really technological advances, but I was able to get a lot more into stop motion, which I couldn't do before. And, um, uh, you know, generally have uh, a bigger scope to things than I could do before. So if the first film was a, a, a technological challenge to get ships to fly in space with a lot of that movement. The second one was to do a stop motion movie. How did you choose or, or get together with Frank Oz to, to be Yoda? When I created Yoda, I said I want him to be really, really small, uh, but not, you know, six feet. I want him you know, to be about 18 inches, two feet high. And to do that, I said, well, what am I going to do? And how am I going to get a character? And what, you know, what am I going to do? Whenever I'm creating one of these films, I mean, I have my imagination. And if I were a novelist, I could just write it, and I wouldn't have to think about it. But I write it, and then I say, well, now, how am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to pull this off? And I decided to do it as a puppet. I thought that was the best. And so uh, I'd known Jim Henson, and I went to Jim and said, you know, do you want to do this? Because I really asked Jim to do it first and he said well I'm busy I'm doing this I'm doing that and I'm making a movie and all and I really can't but how about you know Frank you know Frank's the other half of me and everything and I said well that would be fantastic it's an extraordinary creation I think it was exciting for everybody because it was the idea of taking and Jim was very interested in doing realistic characters you know that weren't really Muppets uh, and um, and so we, we all really worked together on it Tell me about how you first met and, and worked with John Williams. I had known Steven Spielberg for a long time up to this point. And, uh, you know, I was, we were talking about the film real early on when I was writing the script. And I said, you know, I want, you know, I want a classical score. I, you know, I want the, you know, the, the uh, corn gold kind of feel about this thing. It's, a, it's an old-fashioned kind of movie. And, and I want that grand uh, soundtrack that you used to have on movies. And he said, the guy you got to talk to is John Williams. You know, he did Jaws. I love him. He's the greatest composer ever lived. you got to talk to him. 
And so I did. And it was really Stephen that introduced us and, and recommended him. And, um, you know, I talked to him and said, okay, and he was interested. So he, he did it, and he's a, a dream to work with. You know, it's the, he's the most wonderful collaborator. Didn't you at first want him to use existing classical music? Is that true? No, no. I had, I had written it to certain pieces of music. I write to music. So when I'm writing a scene, I, I have the music there, and I'm writing it to the music. And then, uh, in a lot of cases, we'll use that same music as a temp track. So there was temp tracks of classical music in the score. And, um, and with Johnny, you can say, look, I want something that feels exactly like this. You know, it just, you understand the emotion here and the emotion there and what's going on. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then he will take that and he will come up with his own composition and his own themes, which are uniquely, you know, Star Wars themes in this case. And, but he'll give it that same emotional thrust that was in the, in the classical piece. He knows exactly what I'm talking about and he's really conscientious in trying to get the director's vision uh, on the screen. What kind of feedback did you get to that incredible climactic scene in Empire when we all learn who Darth Vader really is. I was nervous about it, but in the end I didn't get much of a reaction out of it. I mean, people you know, were curious about whether it was true or not. And I purposely left it so that it would be ambiguous, so that uh, you wouldn't really know and people would sort of debate it for the next week. Again, I had two more years or more to... Um, you know, I wanted people to sort of debate whether it's true or not true or like sort of thing. Well, George, as you know, People are just nuts for these movies, <laughs> and to learn so much about them and what went into them and what inspired you is, is a real treat. No, well, thank you. It's fun. I hope that people continue to enjoy the films because um, it's, it's nice to think of them as being timeless.